that's kind of the joy of what we get to do as table setters, that, that we can look at this moment, recognize there's a lot more beyond this moment that's gonna happen from our faith step today, but man, let's just take the step. together really fast. Let's just send our fifth and sixth grade out in style. They're going to go to class and we're going to welcome everyone joining us in the online family. Come on, give them your best for a minute. Oh man, what a great, great day. I want to, I want to tell you, there's so many things I've got to tell you today. I'm so excited about, but um, today I want you to know DNA is happening. If you are brand new to the church and you want to learn more about the visions, the value, just kind of, you know, what the, the thing that's making our heart beat fast as a church and, and how you can get engaged into God's story here through Declaration. We would love for you to go check out DNA. It'll be right after this service, down that hallway, past the bathroom a little bit on the right. You'll see a sign down there. We would love for you to do that. It's going to be awesome. Um, so let me, let me just start here. This time last year, exactly this time last year, we, uh, as a church, we engaged in what I believe to be um, probably the most defining, significant season to date in the life of our church. And we called it the Setting the Table Initiative. Setting the Table Initiative. In fact, the, the verse, the theme verse is what I read just, just a few minutes ago during the middle of worship. And I know every month, once a month, we, we talk about setting the table. Maybe some of you are like, okay, I'm kind of catching on. I'm hearing a little bit more about it. We talk about it. We hear a testimony from a family. Uh, we usually get some sort of update on what God is doing in and through the Table Initiative. But today, though it's hard to believe, it, it, we are at the one half mark of a two-year journey together of discipleship and generosity. It's, I cannot believe it's been a year. Anybody, can you believe it's been a year? I mean, it's, it's seemingly flown, <laughs> Melody's back there, yes, I can. It is flown by, but um, we are at the halfway point of setting the table, and so we're gonna do a little refresh series just to kind of wrap our hearts around the messaging again, especially for so many families who have joined into this church family over the last year. We want everybody to, to know exactly what God is calling us to and, and making our heart beat fast for. And so we're gonna do that. As we get going, I want you to watch this quick video right here. It'll kind of show you some of the vision behind it and then we'll dive in. Here we go. as a church, we are in the midst of walking out a definitive and spiritually significant moment in our history. I believe setting the table is us taking part in a divine movement of God that will reach much further than the walls of any building ever could, and it will literally impact generations of people to come. You know, I remember a few years ago when we did a demographic study before launching the church, there was already 60,000 plus rooftops out here and very few steeples, if any. And today, there's so many more houses coming, so many plans of new developments, more families that are gonna move into this area. These are people that God wants to know how much that he passionately loves them and he wants them at his table. So a few years ago, we began to, we began to pray for a permanent home where we could do 24 seven ministry. And like God usually does, he answered in a big way. He gave us 87 acres right in the middle of all those homes. So while setting the table is an initiative, we believe it's so much more than that. It's us choosing to walk in humility and obedience while raising the banner of Jesus high over all these families. I think it's good to be a part of something that will maybe affect generations and generations to come. Uh, setting the table to me, not only setting the tables for people that I don't know, for people that will come to this place that I might not ever see, but also setting it for my family and sowing seeds into them and sowing seeds into my children's lives that they might affect change for generations and generations to come. So last May, as a church, we walked forward in obedience, starting a discipleship and generosity initiative called Setting the Table. Setting the Table, like we had never really experienced before, would lead us on a journey of radical generosity and irresistible hospitality. For five weeks, we heard messages from the scriptures. We walked through a devotional together as a church body and we asked the Lord boldly what it would look like for each of us to take a step deeper into generosity and really into trusting Him and His plans. The initiative or journey had two goals, 
first, a goal of 100% engagement. We wanted everyone that calls Declaration home to grow in their understanding of living a Matthew 6:33 life, where we give back to God what is already His as our act of worship. We wanted everyone to experience His provision and blessing in a deeper way. Our second goal was that together, through tithing and sacrificial giving, that we would in faith give back to God a total of $5.8 million over the next two years. This would enable us to operate, but also seed a large amount of kingdom investment into building our new permanent ministry facility. So let's just take a minute and talk about what God has done. And let me just say, wow, I was blown away. We were all blown away by Commitment Sunday. It was such an inspiring day of celebration and joy and gratitude to God as we recognize all that he was pouring out over us in his love. I mean, he moved in the hearts of this church family in such a powerful way. Currently, 244 families are committed to just over $5.5 million in generosity over this next two-year time frame. And the best part about that is that I think 79 of those families, um, they are brand new to setting the table and they're brand new to a journey of generosity through declaration. And that is some good stuff right there. So this remarkable outpouring of generosity is going to accomplish a couple of things. $3.5 million over the next two years will be for our annual budget, providing for the mission that we have here at Declaration and through Declaration. It'll pay for things like the staff, um, all of the, the places where we meet, the offices, just all of the normal allocations to operate internally as a church family and externally to the community and how we do ministry. The remaining $2.3 million will be paid towards the construction of our first permanent ministry facility on Highway 99, right across from the Grand Oaks High School. Over this past year, through setting the table, God has been on the move. Oh my goodness, where do we even start? Through the secondary goal for mission, which is our vision and purpose right here at Declaration, we've done things like deepen our impact in the local schools. This past year, we provided backpacks and Christmas gifts to over 500 CISD students. We launched student Bible studies in three new campuses. We partnered with the Holcomb Family YMCA for a 10,000 count Easter egg That's hunt. a lot of eggs, y'all. And I think about 1,500 people came out for that Saturday. This past year, we launched Thrive during our weekend services. Thrive is a ministry helping children with special needs and their families. And Declaration also launched a healing prayer ministry called Liberate. We were also able to hire some much needed new staff positions because we're growing. Our weekend services are consistently now over 500 people and we've welcomed so many first time guests every Sunday morning. Now we have 80 new families that call Declaration home. This last year, over 120 adults and students made a decision to follow Jesus. And that's incredible. Right now, over 300 people at Declaration are engaged in small groups, taking their next spiritual step in their journey with God. And through our secondary goal of multiplication, we've partnered with a missions organization called 1615 and are bringing some definition and clarity, some focus to our missional approach and how we serve the generations, the church, the city, and the world. We simply call that our neighbors and nations. And last but definitely not least, hundreds gathered last October as we were able to break ground. Construction is happening, albeit a little slow, but we are well on the way of seeing that first permanent ministry facility right here in Spring, Texas. It's amazing. So where are we going? We are entering the midpoint of this two-year discipleship and generosity journey, and God has only begun to show us what he has in store for us. We don't wanna get routine or complacent about our progress. We don't wanna stop seeking him or listening to him. In fact, we've been asking God boldly, what is he calling us to in this coming year? Like Abraham, we studied him last year during setting the table. God doesn't bless us so that we can stay still. He blesses us so that we can keep blessing others. Our primary goal in setting the table is still the same. It's that 100% of all those who call Declaration Home would choose in generosity to prepare the for the Lord and prepare to set the table for those in our community and around the world. There's a verse that says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it, 
And so, man, <laughs> how awesome is that? I mean, how great is that? What a great problem to have that, that literally the Lord could so bless one of his local storehouses that we can't contain it, we can't hold it, we can't receive it all, but he wants it to flow from that location, literally out to the nations. God wants everyone at his table and everyone's invited. So over the next five weeks, we will be focusing on some key steps in our setting the table journey through a sermon series called Come to the Table. So what is your role? You know, there's many that may be new to Declaration, and you may be wondering, what is this setting the table thing all about? You've been hearing about it. You joined our church maybe sometime after last April, and you're wondering what this journey really is and how you may become a part of it. I know that as you engage over these next five weeks, you're gonna hear messaging and stories of faith and you will clearly see the vision behind setting the table. Our prayer is that you'll be inspired and you'll be challenged to put God first in everything and come along, make that 12 month commitment to set the table with us. I'm excited for you to experience the blessing and the growth that comes from boldly trusting him and stepping out in faith. So it just became apparent to us that God was at work and he was moving in declaration and we had the invitation to be a part of what God was doing and join him in that work. So we just couldn't pass up on that opportunity. So when I hear the term setting a table, that means you're preparing a place. You're being intentional to invite someone to come along. And that's what God has called us to do. He's called us to be intentional and to invite others into uh, fellowship with him and community with one another. Now, others of us made a commitment one year ago, and since then, perhaps, this journey has been pretty difficult. Maybe you went to an entirely new level in your generosity, and you're still adjusting your life to it. Or maybe you've experienced job loss, unexpected financial hardship, and you've found it hard. You've, you find yourself wavering in, what do I do? How do I, how do I move forward? I want to encourage you to show the same faith now that you did when you heard from the Lord originally, and you made that initial commitment to Him. Keep putting God first and trust Him with the rest. For each of you, the next five weeks is about sitting in God's provision and asking Him to help you finish strong. And I wanna encourage you, don't give up. It's a way of keeping my promise. It's a way of saying, I trust you and I wanna walk that out, truly walk that out to say I trust you and I don't need to be in control. So here's an area of my life that I wanna to submit to you. And so for all of those things to be true, I have to finish strong, even though my circumstances changed. Now lastly, others of us made our commitment to sit at the table, and we, we may have had an increase in our faith and our finances this past year. It's not that keeping your setting the table commitment has been easy because it likely has required a lot of sacrifice, but you're sensing the Lord may be calling you to stretch in faith even further to take another bold step for him. And I wanna challenge you to listen to God's voice there. Listen to me, church, these last 12 months have not been easy. They are the largest steps in generosity most of us have ever made. But as we look around, I think I can speak for all of us when I say that we are so grateful for what we are seeing him doing in and through us. Over this last year, God has been stretching and growing each and every one of us, and we do not want to stop here. It's not time for us to get complacent. We cannot stop. The message of the gospel is far too urgent. And as we're gonna be studying over these next five weeks, he's going to inspire us and he's going to challenge us again. That's just who he is. He's always stretching us to take new steps of faith. And our prayer is that as individuals and as a church, we would find ourselves accepting the call to set the table with hope and salvation for the generations, the church, our city, and the world again that the gospel may go to our neighbors and our nations. And one day we're gonna look back on the actions that we are taking today and we are going to say that that was when God began to increase our influence in our city and expand our gospel impact in the lives of its people. This is the moment that we choose legacy as we set the table. Hey man, everybody. Hey, real, real quick, can we honor, uh, where is JJ, are you in here? Right now, JJ and Daniel and Melody, all, all you guys who, who took, these guys do an incredible job bringing stories to life week in and week out. Can we just thank them for that? Appreciate that. Well, Adolf Menzel created a painting entitled Frederick the Great's 
address to his generals before the Battle of Luthen. This historical piece depicts Frederick's speech to his generals in December of 1757. If you saw the, the image, you would see a group of people gathered around. But right in the center, there's kind of a blank space on the canvas, right? Um, and basically, this piece was during the Seven Years' War before this famous battle against the Austrians. Menzel worked on it from 1859 to 1861, but he never finished it. The monumental painting contains the background. It contains the general standing in that semicircle I described. But the main figure of Frederick the Great was left blank. Tragically, Menzel's famous incomplete painting is a picture of a lot of people's lives. The background, um, career, interests, hobbies, pursuits, achievement, all seemingly complete. The faces of significant um, people like family, friends, colleagues, they surround but the central and most important figure is left incomplete, and that's Jesus. See, Jesus Christ has been given a name that is above all other names and rightly deserves to be the focal point of every single one of our lives, right? Likewise, the centrality of Christ in life is the greatest need of every person. So may we not live in this, such, this crowded existence so much so that we allow Jesus to be a blank figure in our lives. Now, with that story in mind, I want to begin with some questions this morning. Number one, do we live our lives in such a way that declares that Jesus truly is central, that he's our highest priority, that he's before all else? Do we love Jesus in such a way that our lives would declare that he is preeminent, that he is prioritized, most important central figure of our existence? Um, would we be willing to do anything for God when he asks, no matter how crazy, no matter how radical, no matter how extravagant that might be? Would we be willing to step quickly in obedience and faith? This morning we're going to look in just a few different texts, as many as we can get through in the time we have, we're going to be in the book of Matthew and Colossians for sure. And if we have time, we'll wrap up in, in Genesis. But let's begin. We're going to look at Colossians 1. If you've got your Bibles, would you go there with me? Um, if you do not have a physical copy of the Bible, I know that there's some on these um, response tables where you can take communion and all sorts of things. You can get a connect card there. There's pens. There's, uh, there's actually pens there. And um, But just, just because I think you might need a pen this morning to take notes, we've got some books that we want to pass out to you right now. This is a good time to pause and just talk about these things that you're going to receive over the next five weeks. This, this book will kind of be your, your hand, your, your guide, if you will. Um, there's different things in this book, resources for you, um, vision, information, language. There's scriptures. There's songs daily that you can be listening to that will prayerfully um, just kind of saturate your life with worship. Um, songs that are going to kind of speak thematically to the things that we're talking about. There's further readings in here. There's all sorts of things in here. With that book, you're going to see this card. We'll talk about this later. This is not for now. It's not for today, but I'll tell you more about that later. Um, I want you to know that as we're going through the table series, there's a place where you can take notes in that book as well. But our students and our kids are also going to be going through that. So our student ministry, Jordan, and happy birthday, Lauren, by the way. Um, and happy birthday, Pastor Sharon, wherever she is in the house somewhere. But um, we got a lot of birthdays happening. But um, the youth are going to be going through these things. The kids received their, their own little gift box today. They, they've got this calendar, this activity calendar that they're going to be going through. So all sorts of incredible resources in order for us to ensure that we are treating this for what it really is, which is a discipleship journey. It's a discipleship discipleship initiative. Last but not least, who doesn't love a free t-shirt? So if you did not receive an everyone's invited t-shirt and maybe you're new to the house, we would love for you to get one of these t-shirts. It's in the lobby in the Connection Center. There will be someone there to help you get the size that you would like. Um, and so please, if you did not receive one, we would love for that to be a gift for you because we do believe everyone's invited and we love shirts that start conversations. We want you to wear that out and about. We want you to be at HEB and we want someone to say, what does that mean everyone's invited? And that's your cue. Unleash, baby. Unleash, all right? So we're gonna go to Colossians 1 this morning. Please go there with me. Um, you can also go into your, your book there. The, the, the text is not in the book, but um, there are some questions there, all kind of stuff. So 
As we open Colossians 1, we're going to see Paul declaring the incomparable supremacy of Jesus. He's going to start in verse 1 by introducing himself like he usually does in his usual way. He states who the letter is to. It's written to the holy ones, to God's people in Colossae. Um, he gives thanks for them because of their faith in Christ, because of their receptivity to the gospel, because of their love for people. He prays for them. Let's pick up in verse 9. And he says, he's praying that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing, growing in the knowledge of God. Here's what I truly believe this morning. I am praying just as Paul prayed for the church at Colossae. I am praying these same things for the church in spring called declaration right now. Thankful for you. Kelly and I love you guys so much. And sometimes we love you so much that we can't leave you where we are. And we challenge ourselves in that same way. And so this morning, as we challenge ourselves on the centrality, the supremacy of Christ in our lives, just know that the things that we see Paul praying is the same way that we're praying for all of us here in the house. He's praying that they'd be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might unto all for the attaining of the perseverance and patience. Joyously, he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Everybody just say, I'm qualified. qualified. Come on, man. God qualifies you. When the world tries to convince you you are disqualified or unqualified, it's not their voice that matters in the mix. God qualifies you. So he says, he's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints, the holy ones, God's people in light. And here's where he gets to this incomparable supremacy language. This is, th this little section of scripture, these, these four verses right here are so powerful. Actually, more than four, maybe six or so. For he rescued us from the domain authority of, he, he rescued us from the authority of darkness. He transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, so if you have ever wondered what's in it for me, there it is. It's gonna rescue you from the domain, the authority of darkness, transfer you into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom you can find redemption and forgiveness. It says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It's by him or in him, all things were created. So he was present in Genesis when creation happened. All things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and most importantly, recognize all things have been created for him. He is before all things. Basically, he existed before all things and in him, all things hold together. In him, all things consist. In him, all things endure. He is also the head of the body of the church and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So what is this glorious doxology-like language of scripture saying to us. It's saying based upon the goodness and the greatness of Christ, also considering what he's, so much that he's done for us that we see in 13 and 14. He rescued us, he grafted us into family, he redeemed us, he forgave us. He's saying he should have the highest place above all. The highest place in our lives. He should have top priority. He should come first and foremost. The New Living Translation says it this way. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all of creation together. See, in these three verses, we see three paradigm lifestyle takeaways. Number one, we see that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God, meaning if we want to know who God is, if we want to see what matters to God, if we want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. We, we come to know Jesus. We, we develop and we deepen our relationship with Jesus. This is the way that we will see God, that we will know God. The word says that he's the image of the invisible God, and he was before everything, meaning he existed before anything. 
Number one, he is preexistent, which speaks to his divine, eternal, supernatural, and transcendent nature, which translates to he is more than worthy of our worship because he has been before there was. He has always existed. There is nothing above him. Paul tells us in in the second part of verse 15 that he is supreme over everything the New Living Language says. There's nothing above him. There's nothing more powerful than him. He is not only preexistent, but number two, he is preeminent. Paul also says that everything, everything was created through him and for him. And because everything was created for him, for his pleasure, for, for his purpose, because of his greatness and also for his glory, we must understand that we also were created for him. We were not created for the things that we tend to give ourselves to often. We were created for him. And because of his preexistence and his preeminence, he is to be, number three, our highest priority. Our highest priority. He must be first in everything. Nothing should take priority over him. He should always take first place. He should come first. In other words, as it pertains to our lives, Jesus is to be placed before everything. A couple years ago, we did a messaging similar. Actually, it's probably like four years ago. And uh, there was a slang word in in culture, and that was bay. We graduated from boo to bay. Anybody? Hey, boo, what's up? (laughs) Bay, stood for before all else. You know, some people say ride or die. That just sounds creepy to me. But bay, before all else. So he's before all else. Verse 18, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. See, we are the body of Christ, If he is the image of the invisible God, we are the image of him. In fact, we bear his image. He's the beginning. It says supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. Supreme meaning superior to all others. In the ESV, verse 18 says that in everything he might be preeminent. He must be positioned before all else in our lives. I like the way the passion paraphrase says it. Look at verse 15, Colossians 1. It says, Jesus is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God and the firstborn heir over all creation. For through the Son, everything was created, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth. All that is seen and all that is unseen, every seat of power, every realm of government, every principality, every authority, it was all created through him and for his purpose. He existed before anything was made and now everything finds completion in him. I love that language. Please don't miss this truth right here. Everything finds its completion in him. If you are an 80s fan and you watched a certain romantic movie where a certain very short guy who always looks taller in the movies said a certain line that made every girl's heart melt. Do you know where I'm going? You complete me. (laughs) No, 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 no. It's him. That's where we find our completion. If you want to live purpose and know what feeling fulfilled and complete is like, You want to know completion. It will only be found in him. He's the head of the body. He's the most exalted one, holding first place in everything. See, I hope we're picking up on a trend so far this morning. He um, is first. He must be first. So here's the the first real take home today. Paul tells us, as he told the church in Colossae, that Christ must hold first place in everything. Everything. Let me just give you a few examples. Our lives, our families, our families. Our hobbies, our careers, our stuff, our house, our time, our money, our relationships, our reputations. To say he holds first place in everything is to say he is the king of everything in our lives. So I want us to examine our hearts this morning just a little bit. Just kind of take a personal assessment here. Examine a few things. How do I spend my time? Think about the way that we're spending money today. Now, as you look at your heart, is he truly the king of your heart? Is he the central figure? As you look at your time, is he the king of your calendar? As you look at your money, is he the king of your pocketbook? As you look at your life, is he the king of your everything? Because let me say this, a 95 or 99% commitment to Christ is not enough. 
It's not enough. He's an all-in type of God. He wants it all, and he deserves it all. And please hear me say this. I don't, for one second, sit around thinking that any of us ever approach God by saying, God, I would like to offer you my last and my worst today. (laughs) I don't think that's what's happening. I don't think that's what's happening. But I do want to challenge us. Are we offering him our first and our best? Are we offering him our first and our best? Verse 18, all attention, let me just paraphrase it my way. All attention, all affection, all adoration, all allegiance to him that he would be before anything else, before all else in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. Warren Wearsby, I quote him often, I read him often. Um, He quoted a guy named Peter Forsyth once and said this, the first duty of every soul is to not find its freedom, but its master. This is the duty that we have that we're challenged with this morning. What is our master? One may ask, who is our master? What truly has the possession of our heart? A great way to understand, again, is to evaluate. What do I think about first in the morning? Does my calendar reflect that Jesus is my first priority? Does God get my first and my best, the first of my day, the first of my month, the first of my minutes, the first... Priority, how do I perceive money? Is it mine or is it God's? Did I earn it or did God entrust it to me to steward? Today, even more than the commodity of time, I'll say this, money seems to be a sticking point. Jesus speaks a lot about money. People have a lot to say and think about money. People get really frustrated about money. But I want us to go to the book of Matthew really quickly, chapter six, starting in verse 19, beginning of the New Testament there right after we see Malachi. And I want us to look right there at chapter six. It starts in verse 19. It says this. It says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Keep your eyes set heavenward, basically. Keep your mind set on the kingdom of heaven. Keep your mind set on the things of God. Keep your heart set on things that have eternal value. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus first. Don't store up treasures here for earth. Instead, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. Instead, place true value on the things that are the economy of heaven, not of this world. Place value on the things that God values, not on what man values. Place value on the things of the spirit, not on the things that gratify the lust of our flesh. Now here's something else to think about. Another part of that litmus test of what has our heart this morning. The things that we spend our time doing, the way that we spend money God has entrusted, we talked about, will these things last? Well, here's a hard question. God got me on this one just a few months ago. I don't even know if it's something I read or something I heard, but man, it's, it started a spiral of thought process of my thinking. And how I'm spending my time and, and, and the money that God has entrusted to me, will those things last? Do they have eternal value? You know, are we sowing into eternal things or will they not last? Will they have no eternal value? Think about it. Think about the way that we're spending time. How much time I'm spending on that, does this thing hold eternal gravity? Will it last or will it not? See, what is it that we truly treasure? Scripture tells us in verse 21, wherever your treasure is, there are the desires of your heart will also be. In other words, the desires of your heart will reflect that which you really worship. That which you really worship will reveal the desires of your heart. See, I love how the Passion Paraphrase reads again in Matthew 6. It says, don't keep hoarding for yourselves earthly treasures that can be stolen by thieves that are not eternal in nature or value. Material wealth, the material wealth will eventually rust and decay and lose its value. Instead, it's a stockpile heavenly treasures for yourselves that cannot be stolen, that will never rust, decay, or lose its value. For your heart will always, watch this, pursue what you value as your treasure. Here's the second thing I want us to see today. The passion of your heart is what you will always pursue. 
The passions of your heart is what you're gonna pursue. With this in mind, go back to that self-evaluation. What do we place most value in? What is our true treasure? What is the passion or passions of our heart? Because that is what your heart and your hands will pursue. Matthew 6, the new living. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. In other words, what you are staring at most is what you will surf. Where you put your gaze What you're staring at is what you eventually will serve. That is the master. It's funny, the world, man, it stresses it, it freaks out, it runs trying to find its own freedom. But just as Wearsby said, we are to look for our master. Because when we see our master, when we we surrender to our master, that is when we truly find that freedom. So what you're staring at is what you will serve. When what we seek and pursue is healthy, when our heart is healthy, our whole body will be filled with contentment. We will find deep satisfaction, fulfillment, completion. He goes on to say in verse 24, no one can serve two masters for you're gonna hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one. And despise the other, you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Again, um, the, the, uh, the Christian Standard Bible says this, you cannot be a slave to two masters. Since either he will hate one and love the other, he'll be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and money. The New American, you cannot serve both God and wealth. The New Century, you cannot serve both God and worldly riches or passions. Your your heart cannot be divided in this way. You cannot worship both of these things. One of them you will despise, but one of them will have the fullness of your devotion. I like the way the New King Jimmy reads. That's cool, New King James. I'm sorry, I just edited it. says this, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other. He will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. I like the word mammon because of the way it translates. It's not necessarily just money or wealth. It actually translates to anything you personify as your object of worship. No one can serve both God and something else that you personify as your object of worship, that you personify as the place that only truly God deserves, right? He's saying, how could you worship two gods at the same time? Verse 24, your heart's devotion and desire cannot be given to both God and something else. Which one will receive your love and loyalty? God or mammon, because whichever one has your love and loyalty, whichever one has your devotion, that's the one that is your priority. That is the one that you place before all else. Remember, the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. So back to that personal assessment again. Who or what is the master of our soul this morning? Who or what? The text continues. That passion paraphrase, how could you worship two gods at the same time? Back to the New American in verse 25. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, Jesus says. Whether you have enough food to drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds, he gives us an example. They don't plant, they don't harvest, they don't store food in barns, but your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? I want you to see what's happening in the book of Matthew here. What Jesus is saying, he's saying these birds, man, they, they don't create an identity wrapping their life around stuff and things. They don't live the identity. They, that, all they do is they live into the identity that they were created for. They don't, they don't stress out and worry about where it's coming from next. They just live in the identity that they were created to live in. And they're taken care of. They're more than taken care of. Watch this, they don't, they don't focus on, you know, mammon, but they always have enough manna. Come on, I mean, God takes care, God provides for every detail. And aren't we far more valuable to God 
And they are. The book of Matthew keeps dropping knowledge on us through this series of questions. Look at 27. Can all your worries add one single moment to your life? And you, why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So why do we sometimes find ourselves seemingly so fixated on stuff that cannot satisfy? Why does it seem that mammon seems to occupy our minds so much as if God is not the one providing, as if God is not our supply. Why do we hoard for ourselves? That's why Matthew keeps saying, verse 19, chapter six, don't keep hoarding for yourself earthly treasures. What is it that we're saving or hoarding for? A comfortable life? An illusion of abundant life created in our own hands that could be here today and gone tomorrow? And we've seen that play out over and over and over. Let me just say, our ability to provide abundance for ourselves is nothing but a facade. If it's God and God alone who really is our supply. This is why we're told in the text, don't worry about these things saying, what will I eat? What will I drink? What will I wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, verse 32 says, but your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. There's a song that I love so much, it's actually in the book for you to use as, as part of your personal worship times. It's just called Supply, and it's straight scripture. My God shall supply all my needs according to the riches and glory. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And he says, I asked for a drop, and you gave me an ocean over and over again. It's God, it's God. He says, seek the kingdom, verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, before all else. Live righteously. Don't miss that part. Seek the kingdom and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So here's our third takeaway for today. When God is first, the rest will follow. When God is first, the rest will follow. So the question today is, do we trust him? Do we trust him? Seek first the kingdom and Live righteously. When God is first, the rest will follow the passion. So above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom, the things of God, the righteousness that proceeds from him. Seek him first. May he be our first priority. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. See, when we put Jesus in his rightful place in our heart and in our lives, before all else, he will take care of everything we need. There was once a monk who had only one valuable possession in the entirety of his life, one deeply valuable possession. It was a precious stone. It was a precious jewel. One day, the monk met a traveler who came up to him and said that he was hungry. He asked the monk if he would share with him some of his own provisions. Well, when the monk opened his bag, he didn't really have anything, but the traveler saw the precious stone and, and on an impulse, he asked the monk, can I have that? Amazingly, the monk handed over the stone. The traveler departed quickly, just overjoyed at this new possession that he had. He felt like for sure this is gonna help. See, however, listen what happens. A few days later, the traveler comes back, searching again for that monk. He humbly returns the stone to the monk and makes a request. Please, sir, I thought long and hard about this. He says, would you give me what you have that is even more valuable, more precious than this stone? Please give me that which enabled you to give me this precious stone. See, the monk understood what putting God above all else really meant. He was pursuing the kingdom of God. He was pursuing the things of God. He was pursuing the heart of God first and foremost. He was pursuing and living in righteousness. His heart completely belonged to God, which is why it wasn't, he might have stopped to pause and think about it for a minute. <laughs> he may have contemplated, but still with joy, he gave that stone. And because God had the fullness of his heart, it wasn't as difficult for him to give that stone to the traveler as maybe we would think. But through this exchange, listen, the traveler realized that the monk had something even more valuable than that stone. He realized 
that he had a need that even something as valuable as that stone could not supply. Here's the moral of the story. The sum total of the world's wealth could never purchase what only God can truly give you. It just can't. No matter how valuable or precious that stone was to that monk, no matter how valuable and precious the things of this life, the things of this world might be and look to you, Listen, the monk gave extravagantly. The monk gave willingly. The monk gave generously, even of all that he had, because what he had did not have him. See, that one great action of the monk ended up making an eternal difference in the life of that traveler. Listen, it's far easier to be open-handed in generosity when we have been open-hearted and surrendered to God. So let me just review Number one, Christ must hold first place in everything. Number two, the the passion of your heart is what you will always pursue. And number three, when God is first, the rest will follow. When we seek God over and before anything else, we will be given everything that we need. Can I tell you this? We said this for, gosh, we, we, you know, God called us to this initiative years back, I can't even remember, five years ago, called Movement. And what a powerful two-year journey that was. Because the heart was simple. It was just, God, as you move, we want to join you where you're moving. I don't know if you've ever read or been through a small group called Experiencing God with Henry Blackaby, but I love this precept, if you will, of, of look where God is moving and join him there. That was the passion. That was our heart. And in that, that time frame, We saw God do such incredible things. And then God brings us to setting the table. And man, this this last year, I I could not have even began to dream or imagine some of the things that God would do. I'm gonna tell you something. If you were there, you know exactly what I mean. If you didn't have the opportunity to be there, maybe you're new. Last year, somewhere around this time frame, we stood on that property for the very first night. And some of us led the way with saying, here's what the Lord is saying to me, and I'm gonna make a commitment. I have never been that more overcome with emotion, shy of the day that I married Kelly and shy of the day that I saw my kids for the first time with my own eyes. Standing on that property that God obviously gave to this church and seeing God's people worship there, I don't even have words. And I know it's just a testimony in spite of me, in spite of us, right? I know it's just a testimony of the kindness and the goodness and the greatness of God. We trust him and he gives us everything we need. It's in his time. I've been trying to tell him, hey, God, December would be awesome for that building. And God's like, yeah, well, hold up. I got more things to do. Hopefully it's not too much longer, more things to do. But you know what I'm saying? God is just moving in such powerful ways. And I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. I know sometimes it's challenging to talk about things like dying to self and surrendering and seeking the things of God, seeking the heart of God, seeking the kingdom of God, making God first. I know it's challenging because, man, sometimes I'm pressing into some things that that a little too, okay, back off, mister, you know, whatever. I'm telling you, this is why we say things like we want it for you, not from you. Here's why. Because the greatest message over the last five years that we know that God has been screaming at us is this. It's your heart I'm after. It's your heart I'm after. God will take care of building his church. Can I tell you that? God will take care of building his bride and his church. We are to be faithful to him and faithful to do the things that he's called us to do and faithful to build one another. But God will build his church. God will provide for his church. But you know what? It's our heart that he's after. And so please make no mistake, over these next four weeks now from here, as we go through this journey together, I want you to know what the heart of this whole thing is really about. It's about our heart. It's our heart that he's after. It's our heart that he's after. Hey, would you pray with me for just a moment? We're gonna stand and sing a song. and Just a song of commitment. I wanna remind you of the resources available to you. Please take those books. Bring them back next week. 
sometime on social media this week. If you're a Spotify user, maybe even we can figure it out for Apple users, but we're going to post a playlist of some songs that you can just kind of marinate on, you can worship with. And I want to encourage you day in and day out, do that. Utilize that book. Utilize those questions. Allow the Lord to speak. All I'm going to ask is that we remain open to him. God, what is it that you want to do? What is it you're saying to us right now? So Jesus, I pray that when you see us, you would find us ready and waiting with obedience, first and foremost. God, that you would take full possession of our heart. God, that we would willingly say yes and amen. Hey, would you stand to your feet? Maybe the Lord is speaking to you. Maybe you've never surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus. And right now, I just want to encourage you. The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved right here, right now. Can I tell you, this is one of the most important moments of the whole morning. And for somebody, maybe for multiple people, God wants to speak to you. He wants to change your life. And so those of us who know Jesus personally, would you just begin to pray right now? And if you're here and you do not know Jesus, I just want you to pray something with me that sounds like this. You can pray it out loud if you feel comfortable or just pray it in your heart. It's okay. But if you want to invite Jesus to take over, if you want him to have the fullness of your heart, would you just pray, Jesus, you can have it all. Take every part of my life. You created me for yourself. And so I surrender to you. And whatever it is that you desire, God, Give me a willing heart to say yes and amen. Thank you for your love and your forgiveness. Empty me of myself and my past and fill me right now, I pray, with your Holy Spirit. And I pray all this in your name, Jesus. Hey, with your eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer, would you slip a hand up and let me see who I'm just praying for this week? Thank you, I see Thank you. Thank you. Who else? At least three of you. That's incredible. Church, can we praise the Lord for that? Listen, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I would love, love, please do this. Would you please fill out that connect card and let us know so that we can reach out to you and encourage you today. Sometime this week, one of our pastors is going to be reaching out. We just want to encourage you. No hassle guarantee. You didn't join a church today. You didn't join a religion. You surrendered your life and your heart to Jesus completely. Praise God for that. Come on, church. One more time. Now, some of us, maybe maybe God is beginning to speak and you just need prayer. We're just gonna sing a brief song of response. Again, remember, this is one of the most important moments of the morning. So you continue to pray because there may be some people that God is working on. And as we sing this, we have a prayer team over here on your right that's ready to pray for you, minister to you. Please feel free, feel comfortable to go to them. They're very discreet. They just want to encourage you. The altar will be open, these steps. We just call it the altar. Altars are where sacrifices are made. And I want you to notice as you maybe are praying this morning, this table, God wants everyone there. Everyone's invited. So let's just respond for just a minute.